Daryl, Daryl Owes, and uh, I belong to the Nanaimo Historical Society, a past president and currently a director now. And uh, the reason why we're assembling here is to go investigate the wreck site of uh, Queen Charlotte Airlines Flight 107. It crashed nearly 70 years ago on October 17, 1951, uh, killing all 23 aboard. The cause of the event is um, not indeterminate, but it's not proven. Uh, it's assumed that uh, he was lost uh, flying by instrument flight, flying by visual flight rules in the dark, in the rain. He was en route to Vancouver. And uh, tragically, he flew straight into the side of Mount Benson, and at that time it became BC's worst civil aviation disaster. My name is Steve Hughes. I'm a, with the Nanaimo Historical Society and uh, all-around aviation enthusiast. So uh, that's about it for me. Hi, my name is Ambrose Noble. I hike Mount Benson often and I'm interested in aviation as well. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> my name is Doug McLeod. I'm a student of archaeology with Malaspina. Uh, it will always be Malaspina to me, and uh, I'm here to join this crew and discover what I can. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Patterson, author, historian, Cowichan Valley, and uh, I too am fascinated by aviation history. I'm fascinated by all British Columbia history. Um, this this wreck is, goes back to my childhood, I'd heard, it's when I first heard about it. And coming up last year with Ambrose, thanks to Daryl, was my first opportunity to visit it. And now it's my firm desire that with the help of the uh, Nanaimo Historical Society, that we create a memorial to those 23 lives. Um, they, to this date, they're unmarked. Uh, and, and I feel that should be repaired. That's a foolish thing to do. mention that. Oh. So it's accepted it was pilot error. Well the fellow that was flying the plane wasn't qualified for the instrument he was flying anyway. Correct. Yeah. He had taken off from Kitimat three hours late. Yeah. Uh, not his fault. I mean he was three hours behind and he was fighting a headwind which he didn't realize which set him back. So when he saw the lights of Nanaimo he apparently thought he saw in the, uh, Vancouver. Vancouver yeah. So he began his turn. Yeah, that was mistake number one, leaving three hours late. That was, if you read the book, Accidental Airline by Spilsbury, who owned, the, owned Queen Charlotte's. Oh yeah. The, the real villain in this story was uh, uh, Ministry of Transport. They wouldn't allow Queen Charlotte Airlines for for about four years to, to go with instrument flying. Mm. Kept uh, doing things that created safety problems for his airline, if you accept his account, which probably is correct, because he, he quotes ministry's correspondence. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's the old story. It's never one single thing. It's always a yeah, yeah. culmination mm -hmm. of a mm -hmm. series of... Chain of events. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the newspapers sort of pick it up from the moment that... Yeah. The, be the, the beginning of the end, if, yeah, you, want to put it, and if you want to put it that way. Take it to the print, yeah. Mind you, as you remember, 
Nanaimo Free Press is a real problem for researching mm -hmm. th those issues of the paper. I got the best accounts out of the Vancouver Sun, yeah. who had a man on the ground in like three hours. They had a guy out of Vancouver, like, they must have flown him over. He didn't come by uh, CPR boat. Well, I didn't see good province reporting, but I think province, the province had a bureau in Nanaimo. Okay, even. but the, the Sun had a guy here Maybe he was local too, but he was on the scene within three hours. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, One of the first there, overall. Yeah, and uh, they were guided by the flames, which is the case of Mount Bolduc, by the way. Yeah. The loggers spotted the... Then I think they brought, brought in one of the... This is the perfect landmark for... This, this trail he oh, heading to the log. left here just loops around and it goes right through the crash site. Whereas the main There's trail the, if doesn't. If you go up over that little crest right there, that's where the view is. Mm -hmm. You'll probably... Welcome back to the Nanaimo Historical Society virtual field trip for June of 2021. Um, it's apt to call this uh, field trip on hallowed ground. It's once again, it's a crash of Queen Charlotte Airlines. And at this point, we're reaching the 1600 foot level and uh, we're finding lots of wreckage that's left behind. Uh, this looks like hydraulics from uh, landing gear. Uh, we'll be able to confirm this later with, uh, with our blueprints. But for background, nearly 70 years ago, this site halfway up the north face of Mount Benson, it was a bleak and burning landscape. The uh, skeletal aircraft remains, as uh, we're standing amongst right now, um, as well as the charred bodies of its 20 passengers and three crew members. Contents and personal effects were scattered up to 500 feet straight from the point of impact where the cancel amphibian aircraft flew straight into the face of this rock wall beside us. And we believe this is the rock wall up there. And at that point, the mountain was nearly treeless from both logging and a forest fire that ran through here in 1951, just a month earlier. Uh, in September, uh, Mount Benson was burning and on fire all the way up towards extension and on the backside towards Crystal Lake. This aircraft uh, flew straight into the face of this rock and exploded into a flash of blue and orange flames seen and then heard up to several miles towards Nanaimo. Under driving rain, the first eyewitnesses on site used flashlights to shine their way through the scattered and smoking fires, the burning wreckage, fuel, and oil all hissing under the raindrops. Their beams illuminated fragments of bodies one red slipper, a red sweater, a machinist micrometer, bricklayers union cards, and Pulp Fiction novels. And this was all occurring in this spot where we are right now. Rather contrasting uh, from charred, burning, gory landscape to this, this forest we're in right now. By the time in nature redeemed uh, this one time bleak and hellish landscape, but uh, once again we should not forget that we're on hallowed ground and it deserves recognition and respect. Okay. The circumstances behind this event, uh, the plane was a military su surplus Canso PBY-5A built in 1941 for RCAF anti-submarine bomber patrol acquired and converted for civilian passenger use by Queen Charlotte Airlines and registered as CFFOQ, the ill-fated aircraft was en route to Vancouver from the Aluminum Company of Canada's Hydro Dam and Smelter Project in Kitimat. The plane was filled to its 23-person capacity. The aircraft took off from Kitimat at 3.30 p.m estimating arriving in Vancouver at 6.10. Official night for this evening was 5.50 p.m. and heavy rain was reported in Nanaimo 
with a cloud ceiling of four to 500 feet. It should be noted that the crash occurred at 6.58 p.m., more than an hour after nightfall. Regardless of weather conditions and darkening skies, pilot Doug McQueen continued the flight south under visual flight rules rather than land and remain in Port Hardy or Comox overnight. However, pilot McQueen wasn't qualified to fly by instrument flight rules, nor was the Canso certified and equipped for instrument flight rules. The last radio report from the Canso came at 6.48 p.m. Estimating the course to be on estimating their position to be on course 20 miles west of Vancouver. Evidently, McQueen didn't realize in the dark that the aircraft was positioned 37 miles to the west of the proper flight path. He was actually west of Nanaimo and presumably mistaking the lights of Nanaimo as seen through a fog and rain obscured cockpit window for those of Vancouver. Ten minutes later, the cancel flew into the side of Mount Benson. Now, about the time of or just after the final radio transmission, Brandon Lake resident Frank Murphy saw the cancel fly low and fast over his home on Dumont Road. As a former RCAF flying officer at Air Force Station Patricia Bay, he conducted pilot training on cancels during the Second World War and he feared the worst as he watched the familiar aircraft's running lights disappear into the clouds over East Wellington. Conjecture as to the flight path through the gloomy rain-soaked sky is that the pilot circled the city of Nanaimo's lights twice to get his bearings, then veered to the west. Founder and president of Queen Charlotte Airlines, Jim Spilsbury explained that to approach Vancouver from the west, air crews have to turn back away over the Georgia Strait uh, to position their aircraft for an approach from the sea. At the Jingle Platte Road electrical substation, which still stands, large concrete building that uh, you're familiar with, an operator, Keith Price, said the plane circled this area at only about 50 feet above the 130,000 volt high tension wires. He said he could almost read the numbers on the plane. Suddenly, Price said, the plane roared southwest towards Mount Benson and uh, smashed in a sheet of flame against the mountainside. The cancel's rate of climb from the substation, which is at elevation 475 feet, was approximately 1,000 feet in 1.2 miles. So we are at the 1,600 foot level. Let's assume that he at least had 125 feet of uh, air down at the substation. The performance specifications of the Cancel PBY 5A indicate a maximum rate of climb of 1,000 feet per minute. So he was almost climbing at the maximum performance capacity of the airplane. At a rated climbing speed of 100 miles per hour, and for about a minute of the pilot struggling to gain altitude while vainly searching for the horizon in zero visibility, Price would have seen the explosive impact through the fog at this level from Mount Benson. The aircraft struck nearly a vertical rock wall, then fell onto a narrow ledge approximately 50 feet below. And uh, we think that may be the ledge up there. The Department of Transportation Investigation says the wreckage indicated that the aircraft stuck the face in an inverted position, that is, flying upside down. Without visual references such as a visible horizon, the occupants of the plane could have been spatially disoriented. In other words, not knowing which way is up. Perhaps the pilot was making a tight bank turn when the plane inverted. Maybe at some point he saw trees, he saw land, or he just suddenly dawned on him that the lights he assumed were Vancouver were actually Nanaimo. This is all conjecture, but this may be just the last few seconds before the crash. At the end of Kilpatrick Road, 
four search parties started climbing different routes in the dark towards this wreckage. After almost three hours of crawling over slough, rocks, and slash, Owen Wimpy Jones of the Nanaimo Free Press was among the first to reach the scene of the tragedy. Well before reaching the site, Jones already saw scattered pieces of the plane. He says, there was an odor of burning flesh. You could smell it a mile away. That and the gas, he reported. Old stumps were on fire. Pieces of the plane were burning all over the place. We used the flames and our flashlights to see. Also on the scene that night, Vancouver Sun reporter Clem Russell wrote, we found nothing but the smashed and smoldering bodies of six of the victims. Our flashlights could find no trace of the other 17 victims in the eerie blackness and driving rain. The body of a man lay with his head on a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. Farther away, where a wing was resting on a snag, a charred body was huddled, one logging booted foot projecting through the undergrowth. Another man's hand projected through a cabin window. Only 20 bodies were found after an exhaustive search with just eight positively identified. The rest of the missing are presumed to have been incinerated. It was the worst aviation disaster in BC history and the second worst in Canada at that time. Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh on their first royal visit to Canada sent condolences from Winnipeg while on the prairie leg of their 33-day east-to-west tour of the country. After the inquest at the Westwood Hearst funeral home and led by Nanaimo coroner, arrangements were made to return the identified remains to their communities. On October 25th, 12 of the 23 are killed and buried are buried in a mass grave in the Nanaimo Cemetery, four of whom had been tentatively identified. They were Patrick Brisson of Vancouver, Thomas Bone of Vancouver, Robert McFadden of Vancouver, and John Redding of New Westminster. Officiants of the Catholic, Protestant, and Sikh faith performed funeral rites and ceremonies over the 12 caskets. And then the Padre of Branch 10 Legion offered prayers for the souls of the departed before a bugler sounded the last post. By way of contrasting events, the next day, Nanaimo gave a red carpet welcome at the Civic Arena to the Princess and Duke, where they were greeted by singing mobs of adoring children. The Department of Transportation report reported that an examination failed to disclose any evidence of malfunctioning of the airframe, engines, or controls. Though the latter were so badly burned as to offer no reliable information. It was also determined that the aircraft had adequate fuel on board and had been loaded in conformance with its capacity. Uh, the aircraft is assumed to have at least enough fuel for four hours more flight time. Um, hence, all the fires and burning that were taking place up here at that time as this gas was dispersed in the uh, collision. The investigation of the evidence concluded that the probable cause of this accident was the continuance of the flight by visual flight rules at night conditions of restricted visibility. Whilst it cannot be determined conclusively, it is probable that through a navigation error, the pilot mistook Nanaimo for Vancouver. And I'm reading verbatim from an official report. This may have been precipitated by inadequate pre-flight preparation in that the latest meteorological information was not obtained by the pilot before taking off on the southbound flight. The tragedy was no respecter of persons or social and economic class. One of the people aboard was Joseph Mellison, the chief project engineer for Kitimat Constructors Elkan Project and survived by his wife and five children. Another was 46-year-old laborer, Patrick Arthur Brisson, 
whose last known address was the YMCA in Vancouver. As previously noted, Brisson is also one of the 12 buried in the Nanaimo Cemetery. Those that nearly made it home to their nearby communities were Lake Cowichan resident John David Watson, married with two children and comptroller for Kitimat Constructors, and Parksville resident J.B. Ferguson, a welder and father of four. And uh, Ferguson, I should add, was making an, an unannounced visit home. So this was uh, rather tragic in that uh, turn of events. Founded in 1943, for a time Queen Charlotte Airlines was Canada's third largest, largest airline. After this crash, the Department of Transportation punitively, punitively restricted QCA flying licenses to only short routes, no more than 100 miles from their bases. On appeal, some routes were ex extended by the profitable Elkan Camano to Vancouver flights were still deemed off limits for the Queen Charlotte Airlines fleet. In 1955, and still struggling with curtailed operations, Queen Charlotte Airlines was sold to the rival company, Pacific Western Airlines. Damn. Now, the harder you look, the more metal you see. Yeah, we could have had the detector, but I used to know. Back in the days of riveting. Mountain plate or something. Well, that's why I think this fellow that did the blueprints could look at this stuff and offhandedly say what it is. You get some artifacts versus, you know, that this is a historic site, a memorial site. Where this is from. Especially if anything's in danger of. Um, if you look for layering in that, I've seen a piece that had red paint as well. I don't know what the colors for Queen Charlotte Airlines were. Red and blue, I guess. The military and Queen Charlotte's, mm -hmm. and it's torn from the crash, and you can see where it's melted. All four elements. That's the story, oh. yeah. Is that right, eh? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. equipment. And, it's just and look how shiny the underside is, just like it would have been 50, uh, 70 years ago. This would have been up near the nose of the plane because it, you could still see the slot in it where uh, it would have had different lenses and filters. Oh. And this part here could flip up or flip down according to magnification that they wanted. Oh. Hm. So that was somewhere up near the nose of the plane. Oh, okay. Copper wiring. <laughs> A little corroded. Two spoke generator on one. I found that too. You can still see the connecting rod sticking out of the crankcase, but I can't find it anymore. Was well, this a starter motor or is it too small for that? What did you say the the aluminum was? Exhaust. This one right here. It looks like the exhaust manifold collector ring. It's got all the exhaust manifolds on the back where it plugs into the cylinder head. So it's the part that you know when you look at the outside of the engine, it's what you see. Point in the middle there. Oh, because the, the landing gear still here for seven years. Oh, yeah, because they folded it. And it folded down. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Looks like yeah. Not sure, oh. but I think that could be some kind of seat framework. Mm -hmm. Not sure. You know. And uh, yeah, it was just a tiny wheel in the front. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here's one of the uh, landing gears from the aircraft. Um, what remains of it? As you can see, after all these years. The stainless or the chrome plating is still very much intact. There's no pitting. Um, you see the remains of the roller bearing, tapered roller bearing cage, inner and outer. The uh, looks like a, some kind of disc pack for the drums and the remains of the brake drum on the bottom there, which is aluminum. It's burnt all off, melted off. But yeah, so this is one of the first pieces you're going to see today.
Okay. Uh, right now, we discovered another piece of uh, landing gear. Um, this one is quite intact. You can see how it retracts. You can see the stainless steel plunger here, still shining. And uh, the brake assembly. Now, unlike what you're used to, this is built like a clutch. It's multi-plates that squeeze together. So very effective braking, but very heavy and very complex. And uh, right here, it looks like we have a reasonably intact hatch, small hatch. Um, we'll determine what part this might be later. It could be for fuel, a fuel door, or uh, electrical charging. Any final words? Anybody? Day of discovery. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, I, I have I have something that just evolved up there on the mountain with Daryl. This should be a three-pronged effort. Not just the memorial, and we're suggesting right there. But there there's a headstone in the uh, Lamo Cemetery that's very, according to Daryl, indistinct, you know, not mm -hmm. visible. Uh, that should be addressed, and there should be something in the Nanaimo Museum, like a signboard, a picture of the plane, uh, names, cir circumstances. No big deal, no big expense, but it, but it gives more people the opportunity to become aware. That's that's where it came, comes out today. What Tom said. <laughs>